for lawyers and public policy people and people who, whose jobs rely a lot on influencing, on communicating, uh, I think that, you know, and it's not a leadership principle, but I think something of a skill that ultimately determines your success here is your ability to understand how we communicate. Uh -huh. I think it's working now. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody. So we're just going to get started uh, pretty quickly. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the first EI seminar of the term. My name is Terry. I'm going to be help. Um, I'm helping organizing the seminar this year with uh, Jacob that's sitting right there. So um, we're taking, taking over levels from Go and Elon last year. So for today's speaker, we have our very own Tomas on Paris, who will likely need no introduction. So Tomas is a School of Engineering Professor at Teaching Excellence at MIT. Over the past years, Tomas has received multiple distinctions, including uh, the 2021 IEEE Robotics and Automation Award. And throughout his career, he has had 
many influential ideas that are very that have been very foundational. He has pioneered configuration spaces for motion planning, uh, multiple instance learning in ML, and interpretation tree approach to object recognition and computer vision. With this ESL, we all know him for his famous research on uh, aiming with the same integrating task motion planning and decision theoretical planning for robotic manipulation. Tomas has been a teacher to a lot of us and one of the deepest thinkers in the EI community. And today we will hear from him a discussion on how we can build generalist uh, robots. So please welcome Tomas Luthana Perez. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, let's see. Uh, I, I need to warn you, thank you for coming, I appreciate it. I know it was for the cookies, but I still appreciate it. Uh, so um, the, uh, uh, I, I hate to kind of let you down, but uh, I don't know the answer. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to try to kind of talk about it for, you know, for a little while and maybe we can have a discussion later. Um, I, I, I share the blame, oh my, uh, thing is frozen. Interesting. Okay. Uh, these are the people who are to blame for most of what I will say. I mean, uh, sorry, who are responsible. Isn't that the same thing? Responsible blame? Okay. Uh, for most of what I will be saying, uh, the members of the group, they're mostly here, so they can't get away uh, from, from it. If you need to throw tomatoes, we'll share. Um, okay. So, this is the slide that Leslie and I usually use to introduce our talks to talk about our goal, uh, which is to try to make a general purpose robot, at least understand how you would do it. So what I'm going to do today is a couple of things. I'm going to try to give some context to what this could possibly mean. Um, and uh, we'll tr I will try to kind of be specific about some of the things that we have done, which I think are steps in the direction of getting a general purpose robot. Uh, and I think that's useful partly because there's now, I mean, surprisingly, a number of people who are kind of sort of talking about general purpose robots. Uh, but when you see what is actually going on, you say, hmm, is that really a kind of important, you know, a step towards the general purpose robot? So maybe we can have a discussion about, uh, about some of that. But anyway, so let's start with this idea of what's a general purpose uh, mean. And I think it has several components. Uh, one possible interpretation is that it's a general purpose method for making special purpose machines. This is actually, I mean, this is a caricature of say reinforcement learning. It's a general mechanism. You feed in data and you get something which is specialized to the data that you fed it. Uh, it's certainly not a generally intelligent robot that comes out. It's a special purpose thing. It, you know, it's good, some are good, some are better, some and so on. But it's it's a mechanism for gen, you know it's a it's a completely general mechanism, but the results are for a special purpose thing, specialized for a task. Now this is uh, still very useful uh, uh, for a variety of different purposes. For example, learning what some people call skills. We'll talk more about what skills mean and what could they mean uh, later. But in general, it's some solution to some narrow task. Okay, at least I will make that claim. We can, you know, you can disagree with me later. What else could it mean? There's another way that uh, we can uh, think about it, which is uh, it's something which allows you to do, uh, constructs a system that follows general instructions. So there's a lot of this right now. For example, this is from RT2, which is from, from Google, uh, which is a general purpose robot. For example, it can put a Coke can on Taylor Swift. Uh, I mean, we can argue later as to whether that's a useful step, but uh, the, uh, I mean, you know, some people would like, you know, throw tomatoes at uh, uh, Taylor Swift or, you know, uh, I, I'm sorry, all the Swifties here, you know, my apologies. Uh, so, uh, but nevertheless, this is extremely useful in, uh, if you imagine having a human in the loop. So there are situations in which, for example, you know, a handicapped person wants to control a robot and they want, you want to give it very specific instructions, grab that thing or you know, put this thing here. And this level of generality 
being able to deal with lots of objects and, uh, and, and goals and so on semantically is very useful. So that's kind of you know, one level, one of generality that could be useful. There's another possible interpretation, which is the one that I will uh, kind of focus on, which is a robot that can do many relatively long horizon tasks. And what I have in mind here is make dinner, do the laundry, that kind of stuff. You know, the thing that a, a, a butler, a robot butler would do. So those are the kinds of tasks, you know, multiple tasks, long horizon tasks is the thing that I would like to say is the, the archetype of the general purpose robot that I have in mind. There's another dimension though, that's quite important that we, we need to kind of uh, clarify. And that's the dimension of the environment. So, uh, uh, clearly, one thing you could imagine is doing one task in many different environments, okay? So, for example, uh, Leslie's favorite example is making tea in any house, okay? So, consider, you know, any environment. So, you, you bring in the robot into any house, and it figures out what things it could use to make tea. Now, that's super hard, <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, it's, it's a thing that one could... Uh, be interested in. Um, there's another uh, a version of this in which you could say doing many tasks in one environment, okay? Actually, uh, this is my favorite uh, version of a general purpose robot. Notice that it actually simplifies some things, right? You know, it's not, uh, you probably won't have to worry about detecting elephants versus tigers in most environments that we, you know, that I'm thinking about for Robo Butler, there are not gonna be any of those. But so you can kind of limit the scope of the things that you can attack, that you need to attack in that environment. So that, that to me is a very, uh, uh, you know, useful goal. And when I talk about a general purpose robot, mostly focus on the situation of many tasks in one environment. There's another, of course, uh, setting, which is many tasks in many environments. Uh, AGI, uh, that's great. Uh, you know, uh, you know, we'll we'll talk about that later. Okay. All right. So, I mean, this is just a different way of looking at the at this. If you think about tasks versus environments, there, you know, there's column robots, row robots, and and square robots, round robots. Anyway, um, so uh, you know, there's a, a variety of possible goals and. Mostly with the kinds of things that, that, that we've talked about are uh, really the kind of butler type tasks uh, in uh, mostly uh, limited environments. That's kind of the focus that I like. Okay. Uh, this is another one of all of these, a lot of these are Leslie slides. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, uh, one way of thinking about this is you say, well, there's a factory, there's a place where robots are built. Uh, and what this factory is going to do is it's going to put a policy in the head of the robot and it's going to sell to the robot. And then you're going to get into in your house and you, something will happen. But uh, there's, you know, the, the, there's the factory. Uh, there's a bunch of different environments where these robots are going to do. And in principle, you know, you could say that uh, uh, somebody sends you a specification of the, the, of the world, the starting distrib uh, state distribution and the transition dynamics. Uh, that the robots are going to face in the different environments, a horizon, you know, how long, uh, how long do these tasks take, a reward function, and your job is very straightforward, right? You just have to solve that equation. You just have to find the policy that gives you the maximum expected result uh, over, you know, average over all the uh, distribution of environments. Uh, you know, uh, there is an optimal policy, but good luck. Uh, so we're not going to do that, uh, even though in principle it's well defined. But it's even hard to, of course, uh, like think about what's the distribution of environments. Uh, how do I represent that? Uh, so instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lean on uh, the approach that we have followed in our group. So this is kind of think of this as background of what, why we do things the way we do, and maybe it has some general. Uh, uh, lessons about you know, what it means for a general purpose robot. And uh, our, the, in our belief, the key 
to the to being able to do this aggressive generalization, deal with lots of uh, you know lots of tasks and so on, is really composition. Okay, so uh, they, the you know in in outline the approach is in the factory that is you know us. Uh, we design the overall uh, agent architecture. We build in planning algorithms. We'll talk more about planning, but at the heart of what we do, uh, there's a planning algorithm. Uh, and planning algorithms are by construction composition. Uh, it's not like, you know, ChatGPT might learn to be compositional. Planning algorithms are by construction composition. And then we, you know, can include pre-trained models for vision, language, whatever. Uh, we include hand-designed set of skills to start off with, or they could be RL trained, or it doesn't matter, there's a set of skills. Uh, there's uh, a, a set of uh, samplers. We'll talk uh, a little bit about what that means. Uh, that also could be the hand design or learn. Um, and there's also state estimation. Uh, how do you uh, accumulate your observations to uh, get a state of the world? And then once in the wild, once the robot gets sent out, you could imagine having it tuning up its skills on the basis of experience or acquiring new ones. And we'll talk more about that later. Right. So the, uh, the basic kind of architecture that we have used is something that looks something like this. They, uh, there's a, this doesn't work on here right now. Uh, there's a set of, uh, of perception. There's kind of a perception layer, uh, uh, which talks about object detection and also the local uh, occupancy model of the environment. Where have I looked? What, what, ob uh, what uh, obstacles have I seen? And so on. Uh, there's a layer that basically tries to construct a belief, uh, uh, some idea about what's in the world. Uh, there's a uh, planner, uh, which has some form of a mental simulator. Uh, there's this execution manager that uh, 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 decides what the goals should be and what uh, action to do next. And then there's a set of skills uh, that actually are the real time feedback loops that actually interact with the world. That's the kind of uh, broad architecture that we're talking about. Um, and uh, okay, so I, I said planning. Uh, this is another one of Leslie's slides. So give her credit for that. Okay, so the uh, the, the basic idea in in uh, in planning is uh, you don't have a single policy that you know says jump. Uh, it, uh, you know, there is a, a process by which you uh, reason about the potential outcomes of the different choices that you might have, and you decide which one to do based on the resulting, uh, you know, pr your predictions of what the resulting states are. So, uh, you know, it, it's not just jump. Uh, it's, hmm, if I jump, I'm going to fall off the cliff. Maybe I shouldn't do that. So it, it's, there's a basic, you know, planning system. I'm not going to go into technical detail into anything. Uh, but later we can talk about any issues that you might have. So uh, in the kinds of planning in the systems that we typically do, which we often refer to as task and motion planning systems, there's sort of two levels of planning going on. Uh, one is a sample-based planner that uh, does motion planning, that moving around in the world to avoid collisions or picking things up and so on. And then there's uh, uh, some logic-based planners, high-level AI planners that decide on the high-level steps of a task. And we try to combine those to produce uh, actions that are constrained by the state of the world, the physical state of the world and the constraints from the robot, uh, and as well as trying to achieve the long-term goals. Um, okay, so um, the other, another component that was in there that was important is skills. Uh, let me try to kind of talk about that for a second. Uh, I'm going to very soon switch to movies, so it'll be more fun, but I have to set up a little bit of, you know, sorry, you know, some of those things. Uh, so, okay, so skills. So this is a word that gets used a lot in, uh, in robotics and AI today, and it means all things to all people. Uh, so I'm going to try to make one kind of important distinction. So there's a class of skills that are somewhat low level, which I will talk about more in a second, which are highly parameterized, low level feedback loops, okay? Moving without collisions, uh, 
uh, grasping, uh, pushing something, holding on to something while it moves. These are kind of low level skills. And that's what mostly I will call skills. There's another class of skills. You've seen the TRI announcements, which involve, you know, spreading pizza dough and, you know, uh, be, you know, doing an egg and so on, which is like, what? wow, awesome. And, you know, robot could do that. Uh, on the other hand, there are a lot of preconditions for doing that, that, that skill, right? I mean, you can't just sort of say, I think I'm going to beat an egg. Uh, oops, no eggs. Uh, so, you, you know, you need to build up the world a lot. On the other hand, uh, I'm going to move. I can always do that. Okay, I'm going to grasp. I can do that most of the time. So it's a different kind of sort of setting. Um, the important thing about any skill, though, is that it has to be composable. It's not useful if you can't use it and you can't chain them. So in order to be composable, there's a, a couple of requirements that, that need to be associated with the skill. You need to understand its preconditions, that is, under what conditions will it actually achieve its effect, what are its effects, and then there's some policy that you execute, and there might be parameters associated with that policy, and you have to pick the parameter. So it's essential for any uh, uh, useful definition of a skill that, that you have at least these components. Now, you know, it could be just one neural net that you say, whoa, you know, should I or shouldn't I? But whatever it is, you need, you need this. Okay. Um, so our, uh, uh, you know, the approach that we followed is that most of the skills that we work with, the, the primitive skills are really low level. And one way of thinking about them is the so-called multimodal motion plan abstraction. Uh, a mode involves, is a kind of contact, right? When I'm in contact, the, my dynamics are constrained by, that, by keeping that contact. When I'm not in contact, I have a different set of dynamics. So uh, you can think of modes as particular sets of contacts and uh, you, you can either move in a mode or switch in the mo modes, like for example, from, from going from grasping to putting something on the table or letting go and so on. So the kinds of uh, uh, simple skills that, that you know, grasping, moving, uh, uh, in compliant motion and so on, uh, are you can think of these as multimodal abstractions. Okay, and we tend to use these high level description languages. Uh, you could use other methods, but you know, th there's a set of pre, I said we needed to understand the effects written as a result there. There's a language in which we describe those effects, and those are basically classifiers on the state of the world. There's a question of how we learn them. We'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, there's a, the skill itself, which is a function, a policy, uh, which has some parameters, and a set of preconditions, which are also classifiers on the state. Uh, so, uh, and basically, uh, given these, uh, uh, these uh, skill functions with the description, that's what we call an operator, and it's a thing that a planner works with. Planner basically sequences them to achieve a long-term result. Uh, and so the skills are, are the foundations of these operators, which are the things that the planner operates. Okay, um, to illustrate, for, for example, this is the meta world task, which meant perhaps some of you have run across. It's a, a, a task that was a set of tasks that were defined for reinforcement uh, learning, uh, 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 transfer learning. So it's supposed to have 50 tasks in it. Uh, most of these tasks are what we would think of as like a single or a small number of uh, uh, mode changes. So we wrote a set of operators for these tasks, uh, we being Leslie and I. Uh, uh, all the bugs were Leslie, so. <laughs> the slides, the slides. The slides. <laughs> yeah, I, I only contribute the good ideas. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, we were able to do, uh, let me see. Uh, okay. We were able to do 43 or 50 tasks with four operators. Okay, and the four operators are, you know, move open, you move in free space, grasp, uh, move while holding something, um, and uh, uh, I don't remember what the other one was. But anyway, a very small number of these transitions is enough to actually solve all of these tasks. Now, the, the hard part is getting all the parameters, right? I mean, the, the parameters depend on the state and so on. 
but it, it shows that it's not often people say, oh, task and motion planning, it's hell to write those operators. But what they have in mind is an operator for beating eggs, which is, <laughs> it is hell to write. Uh, the operators for doing the basic mode transitions, you write once and you use a billion times, okay, all over the place. And so, so it's a, you know, it's a, it's a little trade-off thing. Anyway, uh, those form the basis of the kind of skills that we kind of actually use. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is to uh, focus on what are some key capabilities that are important in trying to get a, a general purpose manipulation robot along the lines of what we talked about. So one fairly clear one is that you need to be able to plan long horizon actions, long, long sequences of actions. And uh, over the years, uh, we've worked on a variety of planners that work at the kind of geometry and kinematics level that allows you to, to, to solve long sequence of, plan, of actions given a, a small description of a goal. In this case, the goal is put the objects on the circles that have the same color. Uh, this is work by Kaylin Garrett, a, a, a planner that he wrote called Pedro Street. Uh, and this seems like a particularly stupid task. Uh, here's a, a, an abstraction of making dinner uh, in which uh, the only thing, you know, to cook something, you put it on, on top of the microwave and the thing that you put it on top of the sink. You know, it's, it's an abstraction, right? So, uh, and, and these objects have names like cabbage and steak and, and things like that. Oh, no, I think Kayla is vegetarian. They're all uh, cabbage and radish. So, but anyway, uh, getting a long sequence of, of, uh, of actions that are, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, constrained by the geometry of the world and the, uh, what the uh, feasible motions of the robot is something that it, in principle one can do by chaining these kind of basic low level actions together. There's one thing that you don't see very often in many of the systems is the fact that if you're going to do, uh, if you're going to take skills and you're going to compose them, then it's very important to set up the skill, right? So you need to rearrange the world so that you can do the next action. Now, here's an example of a, of a uh, the, the goal here is very simple. Put the blue object on the table. Okay, so that's, a, you know, that's the, only, that's the only goal, but you have to do a whole bunch of actions in order to achieve that goal. And that has to be determined automatically, not like pick up the first red object, pick up the second red object. You, you know, it, it has to you know, come out from the robot's understanding of the world. So, it's a, so it's a, that's an important capability if you're going to chain actions together uh, in arbitrary environments. The other thing you have to be able to do is you have to take into account actual constraints uh, that arise from mechanical interactions, arrangements of objects and so on. So uh, this is uh, Rachel Holliday's uh, work here. Uh, this is uh, four ways in which a robot can open a child-proof cap or as the, we call them at home, professor-proof cap. Uh, so these are the ones that you have to kind of push down and kind of turn. Uh, and here's a, a, a robot that, that is planned, you know, the result, this is executing a set of plans that were obtained with different parameters on the friction for, uh, you know, of the, uh, of the surface on which the object is, is uh, sitting and so on. So it's, it's possible, you know, in the, in the examples that I showed you before, the only representation of the world was geometric and kinematic. It's also reasonable to include uh, force constraints. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, here's another uh, uh, piece of work by uh, Yang, uh, George Wan, and Yulun, uh, the, in which the idea is there's a set of constraints that you have to satisfy. This is a kind of very common operation that occurs in all of these planners. It's finding a set of uh, uh, continuous parameters that satisfy some, some set of constraints and you would like it to be compositional. You'd like it to be able to, to uh, you know, figure out how to solve one class of constraints and then another and put them together. So uh, what they did is use uh, uh, diffusion to learn uh, models for each of the different kinds of constraints and then have ways of combining them 
uh, to, for example, find solutions via, the, via diffusion uh, that satisfy not just the placement inside the box, but the fact that the things shouldn't collide and you should still be able to reach them as you put them down. So that's the kind of constraints that happen in practice. It's not here's an arrangement in space. You have to also be able to put the things in and take that into account in, in, in finding the solutions. So the ability to deal with uh, constraints arising from forces, from the geometry, from the kinematics is, is essential if you're going to deal uh, with uh, fairly general situations. And now comes the big one, okay? The big one is, Okay, so most of everything that a lot of the things you see assume uh, uh, full observability. I know what the state of the world is or an approximation. I have an image which has so much information in it that it is kind of stands in for the state of the world, even though it isn't really. Um, but in practice, the, the, the world is mostly not observable. There's lots of stuff uh, around that is not in your view. Uh, and you still have to act according to that. So uh, uh, let me show you this. This is uh, some work that uh, Leslie and I, this is actual Leslie and I code. Uh, and that was me when I was young. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and Leslie will show up eventually too. So uh, here the situation was the following. The robot didn't know uh, uh, much about this world. It knew that it, the shape of the, 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 the room and that there is a table in the corner. And it's using the table as a reference point. And the robot's goal is to get out of the room. You know, it, 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 feels, it feels, you know, it's, it's, it's escape, right? You know, ah, I've been in this room for all my life. I want to get out. So, uh, but uh, the, the mean humans put uh, chairs in the way. So, it, you know, it, it wakes up, it looks, it sees the chairs. Huh, what can I do with these things? And it figures out where to move them. When, when we were filming this, it grabbed the chair and decided to go, woo, you know, and we said, oh, it's not working. But no, it, it, it decided to put it outside. <laughs> so, you know, I picked it up and put it outside. Um, and then, you know, uh, aha, my target chair, and then, you know, uh, success. Uh, the, the point about this is it started out without detailed models. It started out without the uh, knowing exactly where things were and so on. And you have to kind of look around. If you, if you watch this uh, movie a little more carefully, you see that the robot's head is going, and it's deciding where to look to get the information it needs in order to uh, proceed with the task. It looks to see whether the area is clear. It looks you know, around to, to try to uh, get the information uh, that it needs. So that's, that's the kind of cool thing about that. This is another example, uh, this one from Kalen. Uh, and uh, the example is the here is the, the goal is to uh, find the spam uh, can and put it on the table, or put it up there. So it's, it has a distribution it says, okay, well, the scan, that spam can have to be in one of these drawers and so on. And it has to you know, plan out a sequence in which it's going to look at the different things uh, and in order to look, it has to, you know, open or close the drawer. So the whole thing is, is being done uh, automatically, uh, deciding what to look at, uh, deciding what to move out of the way and, and everything. So this is a, a classic example of partially observed task conversion planning. And this is a kind of uh, skill that's going to be necessary for any robot to work in any environment that's not a game. Um, and uh, it's not so something that you see in a lot of systems, but it is an important part of what, uh, what we need to do. Um, this is uh, a, a cute case. One of, you know, the, the way we choose uh, uh, research topics is by reading the related work in other papers that say, these guys can't do this, right? So then we, you know, we proceed to do that. Uh, so the standard thing for many years from the camp front is, oh, they, they can do long horizon stuff, they can do partially observed stuff, but they need models. Okay, so this is planning without models. That is no prior 3D model. Uh, so the idea is, uh, uh, this is work from uh, uh, Aidan, uh, Shaolin, and Kaylin Garrett. Uh, and, you know, the, the robot was, when it started out, saw the box and 
put the box into the blue area because that's what it's told to do, to put things in the blue area. But it didn't see the objects behind it, okay? So uh, once it put the box into the blue area, it blocked the whole area. Then it saw the two other objects and said, huh. Then took the box out, put the other objects in the corner and put the box back. It's worth watching again because uh, it's, uh, it's, it, it's a subtle, uh, okay. So, okay, so it starts out with just the box. It puts it in a place that satisfies the goal. Then it sees two new objects. Okay, I can't put all three uh, objects in the, in the blue area with the box there. So I'm going to find a different arrangement that requires me to do things in a different order. So that's a relative, you know, this was done with no, it doesn't know it's a box or, uh, you know, whatever the things are. It's just, they're just shapes that it's recognized using, you know, it's built, uh, it's done a segmentation of the scene, a, a task agnostic, a, a object agnostic segmentation. It's put the meshes around them and then the planning based on that. So uh, you can do this, you know, uh, with a, a lot of examples, you know, here it's been asked to put the, the yellow uh, uh, bottle into the uh, blue area. It tried once, missed, then tried again, and then, move, you know, but it had to move stuff out of the way in order to do it to make sure that it could reach it. Uh, this is my favorite. It's, it's, it was told to put all the objects uh, in the blue area. So, it, you know, saw one object, went to pick it up, it fell down. You know, then it, you know, went back, you know, and it keeps trying, you know, it's very simple, you know, you don't want this robot in your home. Uh, but it, you know, it has a very simple, you know, kind of idea, okay, like the goal is not achieved, I'm gonna keep trying uh, until it gets something that it's satisfied. Uh, and, you know, there's a whole bunch of these. Uh, okay, so then we get to learning. Uh, so clearly <clears throat> the thing that, you know, it, it is the case that everything you've seen so far, all the operators and predicates and everything was built in. Okay. We wrote it down, we, we wrote the test, we wrote, uh, we wrote it, everything about it. So the question is, can one learn the, the, those, those, uh, 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 those descriptions of, of the actions? Uh, and uh, we've done something at, at different levels. There's, uh, there's learning to pour, for example. So this was uh, work by Zi Wang and Kalen. Uh, and the idea is, uh, you know, they did a lot of mess. The best part of this is, uh, there, you know, when the pandemic hit, they left all that in the lab. And then two years later, we went into the lab and uh, the mouse colony in, uh, uh, in uh, Seda had a great time uh, <laughs> with our experimental apparatus. Uh, so uh, uh, you can, you know, so, so basically this learned a kind of pouring strategy. Uh, but the important thing, as I said, is uh, not that it can pour now, but the fact that it can uh, combine the pouring skills with all the other skills. So for example, it, so you see here that it's for, in order to reach the cup, uh, it has to move stuff out of the way. You know, if, uh, uh, if you tell it that it, it should pour into a, a bowl that's on top of the orange object and so on, it has to kind of do that. And I should uh, 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 make uh, explicit that this is not starting out with some fixed arrangement of objects or it's using perception to, uh, to recognize the object, the set of objects it knows about. Uh, but it's, you know, finding the poses of the objects, uh, uh, planning the actions in order to achieve the goal. And it's combining the, the learned action, the pouring with the uh, other manipulation actions. And it, and it can just, you know, keep doing that. And, and you can do, you know, all kinds of variations. But just the, the point is that just changing, you know, if you put a, a random collection of objects in the world, it, it presents a new challenge each time of what needs to manipulate it when and how. So uh, this goes on for a while. Uh, uh, we'll try and skip it. Now, we've also have people in the lab, Tom Silver, Rohan Chitnis, uh, Nishant Kumar, William McClinton, who are working on trying to learn, learn the whole shebang, the predicates, the operators, 
uh, the, you know, the, the whole structure. The previous example assumed that the predicates uh, were given. Uh, now, this is an example in which it's been learned from a few demonstrations to learn the whole uh, framework, except for the skills. At, the, at, at, at that time, the skills were given, but uh, they're also working on that. Uh, and Ashe uh, back there too. Uh, Okay, so, so that's uh, a form of, uh, you know, learn, offline learning, you know, it's learning in the factory to produce the, the, the results. Now there's also learning in the wild, which is, uh, I don't wanna to talk too much about, it's a kind of uh, a, a hard problem. I'd like to show you just a, a, a little bit about this, and it's some work by Jajuan. Uh, 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 okay, so look at this video. Um, maybe some of you have seen it, but uh, here we go. Okay. It's not playing very smoothly, but. Okay, so did you see what it, what, what, what it did? It kind of, you know, pushed the thing to align it and then uh, 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 hit it so that it would fall into the bucket. Okay. Had you ever thought of that before? Right? Now, do you think you could do it? Not on that thing, but do you think you could eventually get to do it? <laughs> I, I bet you that if I give you, you know, if I make it into a game so that you could play on it, you'd do it, uh, you'd, you'd all do it, and then, you know, you'd be good at it, right? Uh, but, so, you know, you might not have invented that idea. Okay, so the, the point is that there are some uh, some skills, some some uh, uh, manipulations that can be learned. At least the key structure of them can be learned from really one example, and then you need to practice it. But it's but but that key idea can be learned from one example. And what uh, Judge Juan has done is uh, set it up so that it does. It, you give it one example. It think of, the, of each of the skills as a sequence of these more primitive operations and then practice it until they, it gets good by uh, figuring out how to sample the, the continuous parameters uh, for the particular task. So uh, here's a set of them that it's, that it's learned. This is a, the trick of, okay, I have a big fat hand in order to pick up a, 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 a dish, I have to move it to the edge. And there's, uh, oh, uh, I can use uh, uh, an object to tilt the plate so I can, uh, so I can grasp it. Or uh, uh, this is just too much. Uh, anyway. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the idea here, I mean, one approach to this online learning is to actually exploit this compositional structure. Now, the, the important thing about this is that the results of this operation of learning is another skill by construction, one that you have characterized in terms of its preconditions and effects, because what you did is you assemble the set of the primitive skills to, to get the results. So that's a, a, a cool thing. Oh, this one is uh, uh, trying to get uh, something that is on, on the uh, inclined slope. If you put it on the inclined slope, it falls off the inclined slope and falls on the table. So it's using the stick uh, the, that, that the, uh, uh, you know, hope that it has as a way of stopping it from moving. So that there was a, a trick that it was shown and it kind of put it together in order to do this. Okay. Um, and, oh, and, and uh, she also did it on a real robot, just so uh, you don't think it's all uh, simulation. And uh, this is, of course, one of the most basic skills that you learn at MIT uh, is using the stuff from the banana lounge over and over again. <laughs> Uh, to, to push uh, tennis balls with bananas. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's right up there. Anyway, uh, okay, so uh, what I've tried to do is go through a whole bunch of uh, examples which illustrate what I think are a set of uh, capabilities that uh, are important uh, for a robot that attempts to try to be general in the sense of being able to do many tasks in at least one environment. Um, and uh, what I'm going to show you is uh, a set of outtakes, which shows another important capability that you need to uh, 
um, uh, real manipulation, and that's recovering from errors. Uh, so, so this is to show you that uh, the stuff you saw before was real. It wasn't staged. It didn't actually, it actually fails. Uh, okay, so uh, enough of that. Um, the, the, my main message uh, is uh, that one approach, certainly, uh, for trying to do uh, to build a general purpose robot is aggressive generalization via composition. That's the kind of thing. That's the kind of line that we have been pursuing. There are other approaches currently being followed uh, for doing this. For example, there's what I might call a caricature of the RL approach uh, in, in the factory, which is you, uh, uh, have, you know, have a bunch of simulators, uh, you uh, build a distribution of objectives, constraints and so on, consistent with the tasks that you want to do. Uh, you you know, use a general purpose algorithm uh, and you run it for a long time and uh, you hook that by adding more data and more examples that eventually you can do the range of tasks that you need to do. That's a kind of caricature of one approach. That's the, what I call the RL style. There's the, of course, the LLM style in which what you do is you uh, build a giant vision language model. You have to be Google to do this one. Uh, then you collect the giant repository of robot data with captions. You have to be Google to do this. Uh, and then you connect it to the robot, which okay, for a long time, and you have to be Google to do this. <laughs> but it's, you know, you know, Google, you know, a lot of us are Google, so it's... Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so these are, these are two different approaches that are you know, currently extant. Uh, and then there's, okay, your idea here. We call this Gangnam style. <laughs> and then everybody got so a couple of people got it. We're wondering whether that was completely off the radar in the future. So okay, so I'm I'm going to stop at this point, and maybe you can uh, have reactions, suggestions of how we can do things correctly instead of the way we did them, uh, or alternative other methods that we should be following. So thank you. So who's going to be brave? Yes. We don't, although there are people who have studied that. And I remember, uh, let's see, I started working with robots in 1976. That was last century. And so, uh, and uh, I remember uh, it got to be after a while that I was facing away from the robot. And I could tell exactly what was going on with the sound. So I think there is a lot of information and there are people who have studied that. Uh, in uh, Tufts, there's a guy called C C C Cinema. Cinema, uh, who has I've been looking at that for a number of years. I think there is information. There's a super lot of information uh, from contact uh, and there's a lot of information from forces and all of this really can be put together to do state estimation. The, 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 the question in terms of approach of building a big system is to what extent can you do that uh, compositionally by training a bunch of separate things or do you have to kind of do it in C2? Uh, you know, like oh, I want to do this task and I'm going to do it a bunch of times until I learn what the sound is like and so on. Um, and, you know, that's really the trade-off that I've kind of been kind of hitting on all these things is to what extent do you have to kind of, you know, for example, do you believe that the vision people are going to get their act together and actually do vision uh, and you'll be able to use the output to actually do something as opposed to use pixels. Uh, you know, it would not be cool. Uh, uh, sorry, Phil. <laughs> I, 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 I saw you back there drive high. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Are there uh, uh, insults? Oh, Philip, yes. It, you're, you're on the spot. Sure. Um, so I think you've got this idea that vision could basically provide models like the ones we're working with, 3D objects and discrete uh, entities, statement data, and all this kind of stuff uh, and getting there, but there's also been other avenues which is just smooshing these embeddings. So 
when you make that, you should visually go back and um, the yes. results that you make should not face representations yes. or it's a special standard. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no I, 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 I'm expected to do this because otherwise they won't laugh. But uh, let me try to be serious now. Seriously, now. Uh, I, I think it really all has to do with this issue of how multitask and compositional you're going to be, right? So if I'm going to train one thing and I have enough data to cover the space, I don't care about real objects, right? I mean, I can just live in the space uh, of the embedding that you know connects to my uh, action and so on, and that's cool. And if I have enough data, everything's fine. The problem is getting enough data, right? So, I mean, I I, I always make the joke of like uh, uh, when I talk to machine learning people. I know none of you are machine learning people, but I sometimes talk to one of them. Uh, and you know, it's, it's oh, we can just have more data, right? And you know, I used to be a computer scientist, and you know, people used to, you know, okay, prove that this uh, uh, program terminates. Oh, I just need more running time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I know that that's not going to work, right? You know, uh, no, 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 I think I don't, you know, you're never going to do it. So, I think with the data thing, there's also a similar thing that people don't want to fess up that there is a limit. The data. I mean, if you have exponential requirements and data, you're posed. There is going to be a limit. That's what I think. And I think that if you don't factor the problem, you will run across that exponential requirements. So I think the whole issue is factoring the data requirements. Uh, if you don't factor them, you're, you're you're stuck with the exponential growth in the in, in the world, uh, and you're not going to be able to fit it. So a lot of this, since you can think of it as just factoring the data requirements. Uh, so I think within each piece that you, you know, once you factor it, then you, you can you know, embed it or whatever, whatever works for you. But once you have to go across the pieces, then you have to agree on something in order to be able to do the factoring. And that's where objectness and all these other things come in. Thank God, why well, it's one possible explanation. So I think that's the, the serious, but uh, I go back to, you know, so they can laugh, you know, yes, yes, no. All right, other questions or? Yeah. So how do we handle those things that are maybe like breaking the assumptions of your current model, like the picture body assumption? So for example, like killing the egg, the tomato sauce, those things. Uh, uh, okay, there are, the rigid body assumptions are just happens to be uh, assumptions in the operators, in the skills. So I can I can put in a, uh, uh, a tomato spread and skill in there, no problem. I just have to characterize the conditions under which it works, so that you know. So okay, I have to be holding a ladle, or it has that tomato in it. It has to be on top of this other thing. I have to characterize the conditions so that I can uh, combine it with other things. It's not enough for me to say, okay, you know, when I'm holding the later on, if I do this, it'll, it'll end up on the, on the pizza. That's not enough. I mean, it's necessary. It's just not enough. But at that point, I have to uh, characterize the conditions under which it works so I can, so I can combine it with other stuff. So, so we're putting a lot of the uh, grunt work of, the, you know, the, the feedback loops and all that stuff inside the skill, right? And they, they're, they can be anything that you can learn or build or whatever. Uh, but, you know, uh, I don't think it's in practice. You don't want to end up with a skill for every, every <laughs> if every minute of the day you're doing a different skill, you're back to this problem that we were talking about here, that, that you know, you'll never have enough data to learn those things. So you have to be able to break it down into things that you already have to do and then tweak it. Uh, so, you know, like in, the, in that meta world case, okay, so, you know, if you think about opening a drawer, op opening a, a, a window, opening a door, and you say, oh my God, how many skills do I need? But if you say one degree of freedom to the matter chain actuated, then they're all the same thing. It's just they're moving in slightly different directions. So it's the same thing, but they have that parameter. So uh, I think that's the kind of the trick here is can you find some relatively finite set of, of skills that for most of the things on a day-to-day -day basis, we'll cover that. It won't teach you how to play polo or some, some specialized thing that you have to practice, but maybe most of the stuff that you do on a day-to-day -day basis 
we'll be able to cover. Other questions or complaints? No complaints? Oh, you're, you're too polite. Oh, yeah, OK. So, your, your contention is that from a very limited small set of skills, we can, we can essentially create all the games. On the other hand, that small order one, small order one, which means any number. Yes. But you, the way you achieve, like, the way you achieve one horizon is you have to plan for a very long time. And obviously, the composition of any skill could itself be called a skill. So, at what point do you call the chain of certain number of skills a new premise? Well, that's that's the thing that Judge Warren is, it was doing. Uh, uh, she was combining uh, existing skills to create a higher level skill. But there's a cost associated with having a higher level skill, which is uh, it could it, it, imagine that I just make a whole bunch of skills. The planner now is branching factor is horrible, right? So it has to do a lot of work. By the way, I didn't kind of pause to, to talk about the trade-off between online planning and you know, offline learning, right? Clearly a planner is slow online, uh, but fairly general. Uh, and you really do want to combine the two. You want to get good at doing things and not have to, to do the, the, yeah, the branch. There's a, trade there's a yeah, yeah, there's a yeah, that's right. But the depth thing here, uh, it could be a problem if you learn a bunch of skills, especially skills that are seldom useful. For example, uh, pouring <laughs> uh, uh, tomatoes on pizza, you know, you don't do that very often. If that's in your, in your uh, set of operators that you think about all the time, then, then that's terrible. But the fact is you need some mechanism for uh, detecting what set of, of, uh, uh, of actions you should be considering at any point in time. And so one of the things that, that's associated with learning a skill is learning when it could be potentially relevant. Uh, and that's, I mean, and one of the reasons cognitively that we have a lot of problems solving, doing solving problems is the fact that we might know something that's relevant, but it's not in our current set, working set. And, you know, but, but one of the jobs of a teacher is to say, have you thought about doing factory? Oh, oh yeah, you bring it in and you know what to do, right? So there's this whole, hierarchical or management of what, what you consider that's an important part of organizing a, a cognitive system, but that one has to do. So Ron, uh, so what are you doing? You, you, you graduated, right? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'd like to hear from Maria. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I was wondering, you brought your talking about events and the fact that we need to be able to work uh, with data to get up to the lines. Um, but okay, one, one thing that's good about the sensor is that it scales with computers uh, with data and so what would you do with your hats? I'd retire and go to Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> Maria, do you have a better question? <laughs> Uh, no, no, it, it's, it's, it's a good question. Uh, I mean, I think this is something that uh, a, a lot of people have been thinking about, which is, okay, so what's a foundation model for robotics, right? So one form of the answer is uh, like, you know, uh, Yulun and Anurag have been looking at composing foundation models, right? You take a, an LLM, you take a video model, you take a, you know, uh, whatever the third type is, and you kind of put them together to try to build a, a robot uh, system. Or maybe there's something which is particular to robotics, right? Like what's the, uh, you know, in, in, in language, you know, predicting the next word is the key thing, all right? So what's the right thing to do for robotics, right? Uh, is it, you know, YouTube videos and predicting the next scene? Probably not. Uh, because, you know, if, 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 you know, you can't tell the difference between contact and not contact in an image. So that's not, you know, so what's, what's the right thing to do? I think that's an excellent question to which I have no idea how to, how to do it. What's, you know, what's the, what's the right uh, foundation model and how do you train it? So that, it, that would be the, the thing that, that uh, underlies manipulation. I mean, of course, robotics involves vision and language and all these other things as well. So you probably want to combine them. But uh, the, the, the part of robotics, which I was kind of stressing, which is the actual geometry and physical contact things, is, there, is that a special skill? Uh, I mean, your cerebellum is, is devoted to doing a lot of that. So maybe it's useful. 
Yeah. Um, so, that was one interesting thing I thought. So, the attraction. Only one? <laughs> <laughs> I'm crushed. One, yeah, one. Um, uh, is, so we have this framework of kind of within tech, we have one kind of um, task planner and then a motion planner that kind of you know refines or kind of generates kind of concrete uh, motions from this symbolic plan. Are there kind of reasons to explore different structures of hierarchy? Like one discussion related to like the branching versus refinement questions. If you had like some clever way of doing multiple symbolic kind of nested symbolic kind of planners, where like you know you could maybe like Amortize costs across the planet that way. I mean, I, I think there's some stuff on this. So, to what extent is it explored in this particular Maryland's robotics? And is there like, is this something worthwhile? Well, uh, uh, Leslie's life. Uh, 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 <laughs> uh, there's a system that Leslie developed that we worked on called HBN, hierarchical. Uh, uh, in, the now. <laughs> uh, in my defense, I am 71 years old. So <laughs> anyway, uh, the uh, uh, hierarchical planning in the now. So, so we do this hierarchical planning uh, uh, and uh, it, it is an attempt to try to kind of break the problem up so that you never have to do, you know, you can get long horizon behavior with uh, very uh, short uh, horizon, you know, short horizon uh, plans. The uh, and even in the geometry parts, uh, we also try to kind of break them up. So, for example, one of the most expensive uh, aspects of TAMP is motion planning, which is expensive uh, for long. So you try to avoid motion planning as much as possible and use stand-ins uh, to that increase the probability that you will be able to solve, you know, the, the problem by checking for static collisions, checking, you know, doing this and, that, and the other to try to kind of. Uh, minimize the expensive aspects. So there's a lot of issues of how to manage uh, planning and the computation. Uh, there's a lot of room for learning uh, to, to tell you what's likely to work in this situation and so on that you know hasn't been explored enough, but uh, it has been explored somewhat. So uh, you know, in, in some sense, there is a continuum between a policy and a planner, if, if, you know, and it, you know, you can think of a policy as a planner that knows what the next thing to do is. Oh yeah, okay, I can do this one. Uh, so if I'm smart enough, I can turn my, my very general purpose planner into something that's almost policy like most of the time. If I'm doing the same thing over and over again, I can get very good at doing that and I don't have much branching. Uh, so that's something that I think Pragmatically, if you you know going to do one of these things, you you know we need to explore more. Yeah. Some some of my uh, colleagues in the brain cognitive science department uh, 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 react negatively to that system one system two thing as being a little simplistic. But yes, yes, uh, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, any last words? Oh, <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, any last questions, comments? All right, well, thanks for coming. about the sound, mm -hmm. why you would not combine what you ask the robot to do with what the sound of the task would be? Uh, no, you could. Uh, we haven't done it. No, but why, why wouldn't you use that as a... It's just more work. Layer? It's just more, more work. work.